Hi, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, obviously not in, in person, but in this, this uh, fantastic party uh, session. And I look forward to uh, discussing some of the comments, getting your thoughts really during the, the panel discussion afterwards. But for now, what I'd like to do is to talk about, um, about rethinking science communication to address many of the, the big global challenges that are, are facing us. And I've been thinking about this a lot during lockdown because I've taken on a a new role at the Royal Scientific Society here in, in Jordan. And the RSS is an independent, non-governmental, not-for-profit, multi-science organization uh, established by a Royal Charter in 71 under the leadership of Princess Samaya. And it's, uh, it's the biggest applied research institution in Jordan, more than 500 scientists and technicians that advise on scientific expertise around uh, development for, for Jordan. And my role really as part of that is feeding into research and innovation capacity around sustainability, but also in science and society in engagement. So globally, I think there is this sense of growing urgency around these, these societal challenges. And it, whether or not you, you accept this existential prognosis from former UK chief scientist David King um, or not, it's clear that the next five years is going to be absolutely critical to confront the climate and ecological catastrophe, to accelerate the energy transition, and to deliver really on the, the global well-being targets that are the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the target being 2030. Universities and scientific institutions clearly have an absolutely critical role, but I would argue they've been behind the curve, slow to reconfigure themselves, despite the research and rhetoric, it's pretty much business as usual in, in, in the academic world, pursuing publications rather than public action. So by publications, really, I'm meaning mode one science. Uh, so the, the bottom left corner, knowledge generation through frontier, discovery-led, curiosity-driven science, as opposed to problem-driven applied consultancy science, if you like. The, the plot of the science production landscape, so motivation versus uh, participation, just highlights how mode one science has very little, if any, sometimes um, input from the end user, the public. But there's new, more radical models of, of transformative science that are emerging with mode two science, which is focused on societal challenges, co-production with end users, science that's embedded in social context, social learning, but really culminating the idea of post normal science. So the science of the, of the wicked problem, you know, where facts are uncertain, stakes are high, values in dispute and decisions are urgent. Now, if you map science communication onto that, then I think you can recognize the evolution of discrete science communication domains. So over on the left, the early years of science communication is dominated by the mission of enhancing public understanding of science, PUS. As scientists were encouraged to come out of those ivory towers and to inform the public about the latest advances and showcase the work of the scientific endeavor. But by the 1990s, the, the inability of, of PUS to effectively can connect with the public around controversial scientific issues promoted a shift to public engagement, you know, a, a two-way sharing of science with the public, interacting, listening to generate mutual benefit. The rise of, of mode two of post-normal science re really in the last decade or so reflects, I, I think, um, the growing expectation from society that science needs to deliver against critical social and environmental goals. And that's pushed us into a new domain in which science is expected to, to support or even drive social transformation. Many of the scientific uh, interventions that we're working on are dependent on public choices. You know, it's, it would be easy to, to just rely on scientific persuasion but these societal concerns involve moral and aesthetic choices that reflect the deeper set of questions that are about ethics, or about equity, and therefore they demand a public mandate. So here I'm going to discuss the changing character of the three domains of understanding, of engagement, of action, in terms of three dominant business marketing paradigms. I'm going to do that because I think that we need to be clearer, more hard-headed about the business of communication 
in particular, the role of communication to motivate action. So make and sell business paradigm is classic inward focused. It's, it's focused on a product, emphasizes the importance of an internal production process that creates a product that's then sold out to a public that didn't ask for it, but is told that it needs it. The sense and uh, respond marketing paradigm came into force in the 1950s with the dawn of the, of the marketing concept. Understand your customer, you know, continuously discover what each customer needs and quickly fulfill the needs. The product it doesn't really matter. What matters more is the customer satisfaction with the product. So customers then become the main stakeholder and understanding them is the mission of marketing and of communications. And then guiding co-create, I really just emerged in the last decade. And it's the, it's the push towards social and ethical marketing driven by companies like Unilever, uh, Ben & Jerry's, Patagonia, companies that have a, a very clear, strong social mission to build social value uh, with a customer base, not simply financial. So their approach is, is broad, it's uh, integrated, systemic, and long-term. Um, so here is Make and Sell. Make and Sell, I think, is about being a better communicator. It emphasizes the uh, central uh, importance of scientific knowledge and information, and it regards getting better at conveying technical information to non-technical audiences as the key communication mission. That goal could be raising awareness of a specific scientific issue or generally conveying the excitement of science, the importance of the scientific way of seeing the world and its problems. The skills in that mode really are drawn largely from, from journalism and understanding the channels of communication and that are focused not just on traditional media, but also um, new media, especially uh, social media. So the partners in these communications are yeah, university uh, press teams that provide support, provide often uh, media training, trade organizations, things like the GSA, for example, that work with the media, work with policy actors, and increasingly, thanks largely to social media, direct contact with, with, uh, with journalists. Although knowing your audience is a critical part of good journalistic practice, in the sense and respond mode, this process really becomes instrumentalized. It's about gathering intelligence about who your audience is, what their needs are, and how best to reach them. So the objectives really range from understanding attitudes and perceptions, building mental models of how people think, to using that information to influence their opinions. The partnerships involve a, a wide range of interdisciplinary interactions with social and behavioral sciences, with creative arts, but extend out to uh, philosophy and theology to consider the, the mediating influence of deeper cultural values and, and beliefs. Now, sense and respond communications are intimately concerned with the audience, uh, the, the public, but from an instrumental point of view. The, the intent is still largely to sell the benefits of science to the public albeit through the lens of what public audiences are interested in. And as a result, it can be, be short-term, it can be myopic, and it can be reactive. And yet, many of the planetary issues that we're wrestling with determine a demand long-term thinking and lack simple, easy answers that, that can't be delivered in, in a media soundbite, in other words, make and sell, or adjusted to um, immediate public concerns and sense and respond. Guide and co-create marketing communications recognize the social value of setting long-term visions of what a future could look like, but they also know they need to bring the customer with them on that journey and that the route may change on the way. And the key is participatory action, you know, bringing the customer, the end user, into the process of designing and co-producing the transformative change that's needed. So the skills are very different from the other two communication modes. It's about interpersonal skills, you know, authentic listening, um, empathy with your audience, partnership building skills around uh, negotiation, facilitation, conciliation, and critically guide and co-create communications. It takes a lot more time, a lot more effort, and a lot more money than conventional science communication. You have to be in it for the long run. That personal investment also influences what kind of communicator you want to be. 
and, and this is a deeply individual and deeply ethical issue. You know, do you simply want to be um, to help break down complex science to open up options? You know, the honest broker, the facilitator, or do you want to isolate critical aspects that end users can target? You know, the advocate, the, the catalyst, or more radically, do you want to um, actively work with a community to affect change, the activist? And this all boils down to a personal sense of purpose. You know, why is it that you're doing what you're doing? And what is your long-term intention in communicating it? So finally, although individual science communicators need, I think, a sense of personal purpose, they would also be hugely enhanced if institutions themselves had a clear sense of purpose. Universities, I think, should and could become purpose-led institutions. Which all brings me back to the RSS and my challenge really for the next four years, because that challenge is really to try and develop a purpose-led communications to change the, the cultural mindset, the, the skill set of the many scientists and technicians that are, that are working here. And that means, I think, bringing in um, communication training courses and producing media content, so classic uh, um, make and sell, but also integrating social science thinking into what can be sometimes a, a rather rigid technical organization to better target who we want to and need, uh, need to, to, to reach. And finally, it's about building a number of, building on a number of existing community-centered participatory programs here, mainly in water, environment, and climate area, to provide research vehicles to showcase how excellent science can be translated into meaningful action on the ground. And, that has to be the goal, doesn't it? I mean, making our science communications have a real, making a real difference to people's lives in these times of crisis. And, uh...